How do you do? Some people think of life as a race to be run, with challenging hurdles to clear and a final finish line to cross. The man in our story was a master at running races. In fact, he was so good at it, he won an Olympic gold medal and earned the name the Flying Scotsman. In time, he would run a more important race, not a race in a coliseum on a cinder track, but a final race that he would finish strong because his heart and mind and life were unshackled. This is Unshackled, True Life Stories dramatized and produced in Chicago by Pacific Garden Mission. Since 1877, Pacific Garden Mission has been a haven for despairing people, those who have lost their way. That's why the mission is known as the Old Lighthouse, there to rescue the perishing. The mission accomplishes this by offering meals, fresh clothing, and a safe place to sleep to a thousand or more men, women, and children each day. And it's because of friends like you who send financial gifts that all those in need are able to be served. After their physical needs are met, mission pastors and counselors turn their attention to spiritual needs by introducing them to the one whose love knows no bounds. For many, it is the first time they've heard that God loves them. Now for broadcast around the earth, here is episode number 3529 in the series... Unshackled, the program that makes you face yourself and think. From Olympic champion to missionary, the man in our story was compelled by his unwavering faith, a faith that would be admired by many, yet scorned by some of his own countrymen. Based on YWAM's Christian Heroes Then and Now series by Janet and Jeff Bench, You'll hear all about it as we bring you part one of the true story of Eric Little, right now on Unshackled. I was born in 1902, and as a boy, I had a wonderful life. My family lived at a large London Missionary Society compound in Xiaozhang on the Great Plain of North China. My father James preached in the church, and my mother Mary helped teach school. As a nurse... She also took care of many of the local children when they were sick. They arrived in China in 1898, but in 1906, we moved back to Scotland on furlough. Two years later, my mother pulled my brother and me aside to share important news. Boys, it's time for the family to return to China and continue our work in God's service. (laughs) But, But we will be going without you. Without us? But why? Because it's time for you to start your formal education. Oh, but we can do that. In In a proper English school. A boarding school. So we've enrolled you at Eltham, a school for the sons of missionaries. No! But I must go back to China. I must. Eric, someday, God willing, China awaits. But not now. I found it difficult to adjust to the school in London. I was small for my age and very shy, so I let my older brother Robert do the talking for both of us. I would freeze with terror if someone asked me a question when Robert wasn't around. The years at the school rolled by with each new year not much different from the one before. As with most schools in the early 1900s, 
The hours of hard study went hand in hand with a lot of vigorous exercise. By 1918, my brother Robert and I were exceeding in school athletics. In 1920, I followed my brother Robert to Edinburgh University, where I enrolled for a degree in science. I loved being there. I was free to come and go as I pleased, and at the end of each day, I had a home-cooked meal waiting for me to eat with my family as they all lived close by. I got good grades, and when I wanted a break from studying, I would get together with friends and play rugby or cricket. It was during these games that I had a conversation that would change the direction of my life. It's called the University Athletic Sports Competition. It's just one day. Ah, no thanks, Phil. Come on, I've seen you run, Eric. Can't nobody keep up with you. I'm not even on the track team. So? You won't embarrass yourself, that's for sure. I'm here at university to get an education bill, right? Not spend time running around the track. Oh, but I need ya. You know I want to be a coach. I've got to find someone to practice my coaching skills on, old buddy, old friend. Please. Uh, all right. <laughs> you won't regret it, old pal. I was nervous for sure, but by the end of the competition, I had taken first place in the 100-yard sprint and second in the 220. Afterward, I expected everything to return to normal, but the pressure to compete for the university became overwhelming. Plus, I enjoyed running, so I joined the track team. Well, Coach McCurker, what do you think? Oh, he's, he's fast. Uh, he sure can pour it on in the end, he, he, but he just looks dreadful, don't Oh, he? I know. <laughs> Eric Styles an orthodox, but... Orthodox? Well, he looks like he's having a seizure. His head back, staring at the sky, arms flailing about as if he's fighting some, some invisible monster. Who cares, as long as he gets there first. <laughs> It'd be even faster if he had better form. Hey, I tried. Believe me. Maybe you could help him. Maybe. Be a fool not to take him. You just may have a champion. Well, how's he working out, coach? Well, you were right, Bill. It's just how he runs. I, I tried everything. <laughs> but he wins, right? I, I've never seen anything like him. He's the fastest we've ever had here. Maybe all of England. But you know, I, I'm more impressed with his attitude. Before every race, he walks around and shakes every competitor's hand and wishes them success. Then he goes around offering his trowel for digging toll holes so they can get a good jump at the start too. Why, last week, another runner had drawn the outside lane to run in. No one likes the outside lane because you, you get bumped around a bit. Guy complains, so Eric swaps lanes with him. Did Eric win? Of course he did. He's just not like the others. He takes his faith very seriously. He's a Christian. Really? He never talks about it. Well, he's deathly shy. Ah, he's not shy about winning. <laughs> Thank God for it. Despite my shyness, I continued to win. My brother Rob and I also played rugby for the school, and I went on to play for the Scottish international team. By 1923, I struggled with my status of celebrity in Scotland. I was uncomfortable with all the attention. My name and photograph appeared regularly in the newspapers, and there was even talk of me being selected for the Olympic track team. But early that year, I faced a question that would change the course of my life, and it had nothing to do with the Olympics. Hi, uh, you're Eric Little. Uh, hi, Eric, my name is David Thompson. Everyone calls me DP. I'm friends with your brother Robert. We've been on a few church campaign trips together. Okay. Well, I'm part of an organization trying to share the gospel message by partnering with college students and going into towns to tell anyone that wants to listen. I recruit Christian students to help us do that. Before I get to my reason for being here, I have to ask, you are a Christian, yes? I mean, you never talk about it. That's what your brother said. And everyone else that knows you. I am. Oh, okay, good. So, the men in the towns we visit aren't really interested in what a university student has to say. They're perfectly happy drinking, gambling, and brawling. We just can't seem to get our message across to them. But they do love rugby, 
and they might listen to Scotland's great rugby star, one Eric Little. You could come to one of the meetings. I really think hundreds would turn out to hear a famous person like you talk about his faith in Christ. So, what you say? Uh, uh, all right, I'll do it. Ah, yes, wonderful. Thank you, God. So, uh, you can come to our meeting in the town hall in Armadale? All right, when? Well, tonight. What had I gotten myself into? I knew it was the right thing to do, but it terrified me. I had no experience in public speaking, but I could feel God's spirit prompting me. I think the bravest thing I ever did in my life was to accept that invitation. <laughs> all right, all right. All right, simmer down, gentlemen, please. Gentlemen. All right, I understand your enthusiasm. Gentlemen, please, thank you. Now, our next speaker is one of Scotland's most famous rugby players. He's a... Oh, we know who he is. Let him talk. <laughs> All right, without further ado, Mr. Eric Little. <laughs> um, uh, when DP asked me to do this, he first asked if I was a Christian, because even my brother, whom he knows, wasn't sure. Well, I am. But the fact that he had to ask made me wonder if I could be doing more to share with others what I have come to know of Jesus Christ. Uh, I'm not a theologian or a pastor. In fact, I didn't even want to be here right now. <laughs> but but I, I do want to tell you that, that God is in control of my life. Or I, I try to let him be. And I try to accept whatever happens to me as his best for me at that time. See, I know deep down that God really loves me. And he loves you too, more than you know. And, uh, yeah, I so, uh, right, that's all I've got to say, so thank you. To my surprise, the next day, every newspaper in Scotland carried a photo of me and a report on my talk in Armadale. Soon, churches and groups everywhere began asking me to come and speak. I realized I had been given a gift, the gift of fame, and that I could use it to share the gospel message with thousands. Even the international press began to take notice. Mr. Little, how is it you run so fast, especially so late in a race? Well, I run as fast as I can for the first half of the race, and then ask God to help me run even faster for the second half. Somewhere in the mind of every schoolboy or schoolgirl who has ever won a race is the tiny dream that one day he or she might win an Olympic medal. Now, I had this dream for a long time. So when the trials for the British team to attend the 1924 Olympic Games were announced, I was ecstatic. The only way to secure a place on the team was to be one of the first three finishers at the British Championships and Olympic Trials. My family got a call from us with the outcome. Eric, we've got the whole family on the phone line here. Oh, hello, hello, hello. Yes. Oh, hello. Hey, hey, everyone. Uh, I'm here with Coach McCurker. <laughs> hello, Lily family. Oh, hello. Oh, yeah. We've been praying for you, son. So how did it go in the trials? I, I did well. Oh, no, 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 give me the phone. He won first place in both heats and in both finals. <laughs> and, and he set a new British record for the 100. And, and he was awarded the Harvey Cup for Best Athlete of the Year. And your boy has earned a spot on the British Olympic team. I did it, Mama. I did it. <laughs> But the celebration and excitement for making the Olympic team would soon turn into grave disappointment. And I would even be considered by some as a traitor to my country. We'll hear all about Eric's dramatic turn of events in just a moment. Here's the president of Pacific Garden Mission, Phil Kwiatkowski. Thanks, Timothy. Pacific Garden Mission is an exciting place to visit so why not include us in your next visit to Chicago? 
Any day is a good time to come. We'll give you a guided tour of the facilities, but the best day for a visit is on Saturdays. That's when we record Unshackled. You'll be able to sit in the audience and watch as the cast and crew bring to life another testimony of someone transformed by Jesus Christ. Then afterward, we invite you to join us for supper in the dining room and taste for yourself one of the nourishing meals we serve the homeless. Following supper, we have a service in our auditorium, a time of praise and testimony with our guests, where you'll have the opportunity to hear how God is working in the lives of others. For more information on visiting the mission or for information about the Olight House itself, contact us at Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. Our email address is unshackled at pgm.org. One morning in April 1924, three months before the start of the Olympic Games, I received a list of the events I was entered in. Beside each event, the times for the heats and the finals were indicated. Beside the heats for the 100-yard sprint was one fateful word. Sunday. I don't run on Sundays. God's day. My dreams of running in the Olympics were dashed. I was brought before the British Olympic Committee. Uh, young man, you have an opportunity to represent your country in the world's preeminent sporting competition. There is no greater honor, and I'm sure the committee agrees. Sir, as far back as I can remember, I was taught that Sunday was a day of rest and a day of reverence for God. So we all do respect. My greatest honor is to give Sundays to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. With your son, <laughs> our success in the 100 depends on your being there. You've got a good chance for the gold. Can't you just for one day, just think country first and God second? One day? Sunday is God's day. And not even the promise of a gold medal can sway me from that belief. For me, it's always God first and country second. Pardon, pardon, Mr. Chairman, gentlemen. What if Eric ran in another event that does not race on Sunday? We, we could make the best of a bad situation. What event? We, uh, I know Eric's a 100 sprinter, but maybe he could run the 200 meter. Why, he wouldn't even be favoured to place in that race, much less win. No, 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 no. no, I'd be willing. I can't promise victory, but you get my best. What do you say, Mr. Chairman? They don't call in the flying Scotsman for nothing. Well, give us a moment. Um, gentlemen, what do you say? All right, Mr. Little... We'll let you run. <laughs> good man, good man. July 5th, 1924. The eight Olympic Games of modern times were officially opened. Now, I was still in school, but I got special permission to compete as long as I got my assignments done. On July 6th, the next day, while fellow British athlete Harold Abrams was on his way to Olympic gold in the 100 metres, I was given a Sunday sermon at the Scotskirk Church in Paris. <clears throat> I, uh, I have friends competing in the games this morning and I, uh, well, I, I wish them well. They are there with many others representing many nations, sharing in the belief that athletic competition possesses the, the power to lift up humankind and count for good among the nations of the world. And, you know, well, I, I do believe that the games are a good thing. They are nothing compared to the peace and, and power that God can provide if we wait upon him. I want to share these verses I've taken from Isaiah chapter 40. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him less than nothing and vanity. He bringeth the princes to nothing. He maketh the judges of the earth as vanity. Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? He giveth power to the faint 
and to them that have no might he increaseth strength. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. I, I, just, just a minute. Uh, what? Eric! Coach, what, what are you, what, what time is it? The British Olympic Committee has decided to offer you entrance into the 400 metres. They have? Yes! Another shot at a medal. What's wrong? I have no experience in the 400. That's, it's not a race. It will be in three days. <laughs> My first race in the games was the 200 metres. I got a slow start off the blocks, but closed the gap enough to win a bronze medal. Yet I received little praise for this achievement. In fact, some in the stands made their disgust known. At this time, I received a letter from my brother Robert, who had gone on to do mission work in China. Dear brother, there is turmoil in this country. These people need as much help as they can get, Eric. Is our Lord calling you back to China? Between the accusations of being a traitor to my country and the news about China, I knew I had to pray. Lord, some say I'm a traitor, but I, I just want to honour you by obeying your commandments and keeping the Sabbath holy. I want to do the right thing because I love you, Lord. I want you to be glorified, and if you can use me to do that, whether here or in China, liked or despised, whatever your will, show me your way. I will follow. Good afternoon and welcome, listeners. It's a sweltering 113 degrees here in Paris, where the Olympic crowd has dubbed the Cologne Stadium the Cauldron, and it is a fitting nickname. The runners are warming up on the track as they prepare for the 400 metres final. American Horatio Pitch and England's own Guy Butler are considered the favourites here today. Eric! Eric, wait up! Dave, what are you doing out here? Uh, I know. Uh, Messieurs are not allowed on the track. The race is about to start. Eric, I want to give this to you. Uh, what is it? A note. Read it when I go. I wanted to say... Well... I understand why you didn't run on Sunday. Not everyone does, but I do. Whatever happens out here today, I know you honoured God first. Thanks, Thief. All right. Godspeed. Keep an eye on Fitch. He's got to kick. Right. Well, let's see what Thief's note says. Eric, in the old book it says, He who honours me, I will honour. Runners, take your positions. God, you made me fast. And when I run, I feel your pleasure. Let me delight in you. On your mark. Get set. And they're out of the block quickly. The American Horatio Pitch boasts to an early lead, followed closely by Conrad Taylor. Thank you. 
Thank you, everyone. It's been a wonderful experience to compete in these Olympic Games. And, and uh, to win a gold medal! I, <laughs> I, to win a gold medal. But, uh, God has been so good to me. I never imagined such a prize, but ever since I've been a young lad, I've had my eyes on a different prize. Uh, you see, each one of us is in a greater race than any I have run here in Paris. And this race ends when God gives up the medals. And so I will continue to run this race for God. And my next step in this race is to buy a one-way ticket to China. What? Oh, Eric, what are you talking about? Have you lost your mind? You've just won the Olympics. The world is laid out before you. You can grab it by the tail. Now's the time. Coach, I appreciate your support and belief in me, but I'm leaving to become a missionary in China. When I left for China in July of 1925, I had no idea that my most challenging race lie just ahead. Scotland wouldn't see another gold medal until 1980, when Alan Wells won the 100 meter sprint, the race that Little refused to run on Sunday. Just after his victory, Wells stated simply, that one's for Eric Little. Eric Little achieved greatness with his athletic prowess, but the greater part of Eric's life happened in the shorter part of it, which we'll bring to you next week in the conclusion of the Eric Little story. Listening friend, is the race you're running challenging? The Bible says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You don't have to run the race of life alone, friend. Jesus wants to be right there with you, cheering you on and drawing you closer to him. If you'd like to know more of what it means to have a life in Christ, get in touch with Pacific Garden Mission. 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607.